Some exchange betting companies run short-lived promotions, like months-long offers of low commission. At BetDag, we wanted to change the way we did things, so we set our commission at 2% permanently. That's 2% on football, horse racing, golf, almost any sport. 2%. That's just one way that BetDag is changing for the better. For the better, like you. BetDag, the 2% commission exchange. Over 18s only, please gamble responsibly. everyone, my name is Aline McCain and you are listening to the OzTurk Overview, the number one fan-run podcast for all things great and Turkish. And I would be remiss if I didn't say that Big Ali Mozturk was the sole reason why we won 2-0 over Doncaster. Obviously that was all down to him and that's all we're going to talk about on today's episode. And if you're still listening, then thankfully I can now tell you that that's not the case. We're going to have a normal podcast as per where we're going to revel in Sunderland's 2-0 comprehensive, comfortable victory over fellow playoff rivals, Doncaster. So, joining me to talk about this is Johnny Goldsmith, as always, the studio stalwart. How are you doing? I'm all right, Alex. Good stuff. Um, it was good to see your boy get yeah, a decent, my boy. Oh, decent, my, uh, decent game. I feel like a proud I'm dad, proud. Yeah. honestly. I've been, I've, all those weeks I've spent ironically venerating Ali Mozturk have really just like borne fruit now. I never expected to see that name on the team sheet, but <laughs> anyway, we'll get to that. I'm also joined by BBC Newcastle's Nick Barnes. How are you doing, Nick? I'm very good, and I spoke to Ali after the game, um, and I think he's like a metaphor for everything that's happening at the football club at the moment. What a nice guy. He is just a uh, top bloke. Uh, really, I, I'm gushing here for you and for him because... Um, <laughs> You couldn't hope to meet a nicer guy, uh, no. it, and and not a hint of uh, bitterness or a weary sort of res- resignation to a season that has, has effectively been lost for him because he's played so little. No, it's like a, a little boy who has been given the keys to the sweet shop. Mm-hmm. The right characters, Absolutely clearly there. Fantastic. That's really good to see. So yeah, just to get everyone up to speed, I'd imagine we've all seen the Doncaster game, but I'll give you a brief summary just in case you haven't. The most crucial part of this game was the fact that Jack Ross picked a very fundamentally different side to the one that lost 5-4 to Coventry. He made some very, very big changes. I I really wish I was as fearless as he was when when he was doing this. But basically, he lined up with McLaughlin, and then in the the centre-back pairing, he switched out Baldwin and Flanagan for Jimmy Dunn and Ali Mozturk. And then joining him was 9 Oviedo, Catamol, Power, Honeyman, McGeady, Morgan and Wyke. So the whole team was set up with a 4-2-3-1 with an entirely different back line. It was, well, a, a lot of alarm bells I think were ringing because people weren't sure what to expect, you know. But all has gone well. We've won 2 nil thanks to a superbly aesthetic strike from Lewis Morgan in, I believe, the 10-20 minute mark was very early on in the game. And that was followed by Jimmy Dunn's header, which was guided over the Doncaster keeper and just tucked away by Charlie Wyke, which rounded off a 2-0 win with no reply in the second half. So, all's well that ends well. It was a really, really good, comfortable win over a very good team. So, with that in mind, I would be having the three-word review now, but I was in such a good mood, we're going to have the four-word review, get an extra word in there, and I'm really glad I did, because there were some crackers here as well. So... Joe Gorman says Brian Oviedo is class. Mark Carrick says we are going up. Mark Wilson says best atmosphere for ages. Kev Taylor says best atmosphere this season. Dave Pick says playing for the badge. Craig says Charlie Wyke scores goals. Andrew Much says totally classy professional performance. Red and White Rizzo says wonderful Wizard of Ozturk. Class. Dave B says, <laughs> I love this one. I was increasing, I was reading this one in the car yesterday, I was increases. Dave B says, the Turk says no. <laughs> Brilliant. Craig Cowan says, Charlie Wyke, ultimate warrior. David Keeler says, Pompey game is massive. Someone called Bomb Diggy Diggy says, Super Oz Turk owns Marquise. And <laughs> Andy Jackpot says, Turkish wrestling champion. Yep. Fantastic. So, let's get into the nitty-gritty of the game. We'll throw this question to you first of all, Nick. As we've said there, it was a big, big call changing that team. So, how did you feel when that team was announced? When you saw that team sheet and you saw that setup, how did you feel about it? Um, I thought it was a huge gamble. It was a big risk. But I, I, that, I mean, that's what fascinates me about Jack Ross. If Jack Ross 
were sat where we're sitting now, he would probably be writing a thesis now on the past week in his life, the Coventry game and then the game against Doncaster Rovers because they couldn't be so... They, they're so far apart. They're so far removed. But in a, in, in a sort of... Um, in one small sort of way, they're, they're, they're the sort of... Uh, the, 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 if you put a microscope on them, that's everything about football management and 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 the art of football management. The Coventry game was an aberration. I think it's a it's a game that stands alone on itself this season. I think that that game was going to happen somewhere down the line. Um, a lot of people have said earlier in the season this team is either going to wallop someone six nil or it's going to be beaten six nil by someone. I think that Coventry game was that game. It, it's a standalone game, and all the problems that that Sunderland have had with their defence. Um, and not scoring goals, et cetera, et cetera, all sort of came together in one 90-minute burst where the defending was just rank. Um, and the, and the, the four goals they scored, by one manner or another, took deflections and all sorts, but it was just a sort of random match. And yet we get then to the, the Doncaster game uh, where suddenly we see a, a, a solid, professional, um, very sort of... very how would you describe it? Very um, comprehensive. Comprehensive display. I mean, I spoke to the Radio Sheffield Doncaster reporter afterwards and he was sort of, his, he just stood in shock. He said, I really hope we don't play Sunderland in the playoffs mm -hmm. because we have just been taken apart. And that 2-0, in a way, flattered um, Doncaster because it could have been four or five. I mean, the second half, the post, a couple of other chances Absolutely. that Sunderland had, it could have been a much more, it could have been that five or six nil win for Sunderland. The, going back to the, the, the gamble, I mean, I thought, it, it, I mean, I said to Jack Ross afterwards, you're probably going to deny it's a gamble because in the week you'd spoken about watching the players all week and you know how they're reacting to um, the Coventry game. You've watched them in training, you've been speaking to them, you, you're watching their body language, their whole approach and and, and you, you'll probably say it's not a gamble. But actually, to his credit, Jack Ross said, no, it was a risk. It was a gamble and it could have it could have backfired, but it didn't. I think, you know, the, I'd asked him in the week whether he'd bring Oz Turk in because of his experience. I mean, Oz Turk is a, you know, he's, he's got a lot of football under his belt and in a way he's the ideal person to bring in for the last few games of the season because of that experience. But he, he played a straight back with it, wouldn't talk about Oz Turk, wouldn't talk about Dunn, sort of went back to talking about the squad as a whole and watching them in training and so on and so on. Um, but it, it paid off. I think Oz Turk w w was solid. He did, he, you know, he, he does what it says on the tin. He hasn't got pace, but he's a, an experienced, bulky centre half. A non nonsense centre back. Yeah, just gets rid of the ball. I, okay, as Benno said at the weekend, perhaps he likes wants to pick a fight too much, uh, and he maybe got away with one. Um, but that's probably just what they need because that's what teams at the top in this division have got. You look at Portsmouth; they they grab a last minute winner at the weekend, and who scores it? One of the centre backs. Um, I think it was a rather dubious goal as well, it wasn't it? It probably was, but I think the, the point is that they've got bulky, strong, sturdy centre-backs and Sunderland haven't. So Ozturk coming in, I think, is, it was a big plus. Done, uh, um, a lot of people have pointed out on social media over the last week or so, you look at the statistics when Dunn's played, they haven't conceded many goals and they've, they've won more than they've lost, um, etc. And, and so he also adds height and that proved valuable in the goal. Yeah, White's I was goal. about to say, yeah. Um, so... You've got a pairing there now that um, didn't really put a foot wrong at the weekend, and it'd be very hard pushed to see them, you know, losing their place now for Peterborough and, and possibly the remaining games of the yeah. season. Yeah, and we're going to get on, I think, a little bit later about um, how you would set up for the Peterborough game in light of how Sunderland have played against Doncaster. But I'll throw this question at you now, Johnny, because we've talked at length there about the team lineup. What was it about that setup that worked compared to the the? The absolute clangor of a Coventry game because the setup there, the, the 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 way we approached that game, we were we were flawed from the get go. But against Doncaster, we were just well, we were first best. At, we were first best at everything, I suppose. I think you had to just try different things and test the players because we we used to having Will Grigg up front, Ledbetter in the middle, used to having the same centre backs, and I guess maybe Doncaster didn't know what to expect. Well, we didn't either, but I feel like maybe they didn't know what to expect because it's a completely different team to what we've seen this season. Um, we used to having Will Grigg up front and he wasn't there. So we had to approach things differently. Charlie Wyke being a um, brilliant performer uh, again this week uh, this weekend. Um, we also had, as I said, Power and Honeyman um, and Catamall in the middle. 
something's different. No, no lead bit of there to spray the ball. So it'll be interesting to see how the midfield would work. And then us took and done um, again, untried. Don't know really what to expect. And I guess maybe just trying something different. It was just refreshing and. Mm-hmm. How crucial was the formation, do you think? Because we reverted back to the 4 I don't think it was absolutely crucial. Yeah. Because I think everyone's been talking about 4-4-2 and there's been this clamour. I think it's an extraordinary season because Wyke and Morgan and Honeyman have been three that have been castigated on, on occasions by fans and yet now they're heroes. You know, they're, mm-hmm. And, and I, I, I've never quite understood where that castigation's come from because Wyke has been injured. He's had a you know dreadful season in that sense. Morgan, I like Morgan, he likes to get forward, he doesn't want to pass the ball backwards, he wants to take it forwards all the time, he's been knocking on the door in terms of goals the last few weeks, and Honeyman, as I've seen a couple of people mention this weekend, what he does is breaks up play, he does that very, very well, because he's got you know, a high energy player, he, he has that burst across the pitch, and, and yeah, he might give the ball away, he might lose it on occasions, but he also disrupts play, and he makes it very difficult for mm-hmm. defenders to, to pin him down. And that formation now, has come together the 442 it's great when it works but it offers the center backs absolutely no protection whatsoever and that was the problem with Baldwin and Flanagan they're sitting sort of bare to the world and and and, that, and they were horribly exposed by Coventry's pace because there was nobody in front of them to break it up um and you know Baldwin and Flanagan were the best one in the world technically they're very very good players but they're not they're not strong they're not physically no. strong and that's where teams in league 1 were steamroller teams mm-hmm. like Sunderland because they will use the they're big, burly. Look, look at John Marquis at, at, at the weekend. Big, strong centre forward, and you can see why he's got twenty-three goals this season. I think John, but Marquis he didn't get was, a sniff. No, on Saturday. Um, and, but that's that's the sort of player that in League One you're going to come up against. And Baldwin and Flanagan were the best one in the world. They want to try and play the ball out. And they don't want to get involved in a physical bot- battle. Ozturk does, and, and 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 you can see the difference. Yeah. Absolutely. I think if you had Baldwin and Flanagan up against Marquis with the same setup, I think Doncaster would have ran riot, to be honest. I would have. Well, I think they would because Rowe, uh, Wilkes as well, although he, he went down a lot of blind alleys, he's got a bit of pace. Yeah. And I think he, he would have got in behind mm-hmm. on a number of occasions. Mm-hmm. I think any if a team can cut through the middle with their pace, then I think that, that 4-4-2 would be a disaster to be up against. I think, as you say, as you said earlier there, Nick, it was, I think, inevitable that you're going to have one game a season where you drop an absolute clangor, and we did that by shipping five at home to Coventry. And again, fair enough, we we'll score four, but as you say, we're playing a four-four-two, and you're just getting, you know, the, the the pace and the power of Coventry. We're just cutting through it like a hot knife through butter through the middle. You've got Leadbitter in power. Obviously, Leadbitter is 32. You know, he's not getting any younger. He certainly hasn't got the pace he would have had in his younger days. Max Power for me, I mean. I, in, in the, I've I'd, on a whole I rate him, but I'd, I think he, he wasn't winning the thing against Coventry. So they were just dispossessing from there, and then they were just slicing through, and they're going right through the middle. But as we've said there, having the four-two-three-one offers so so much support for the defenders. Well, I think they've got to be more. Can- I think Sunderland had to be more canny with their formation because they've got those weaknesses. They're not a big team. They, you know, look at the height through the side. There's, there's very little height on the team. They're not a team graced with pace. If you look, if you look. You know how, who who's really a natural athlete? Who's got pace? So Nyan, um, struggling then to sort of. Uh, Jerome Honeyman. Sinclair had pace. Yeah. <laughs> um, so I think Jack Ross, to, a, to an extent, was almost forced into playing four four two. There was a sort of momentum building that they had to win games and mm-hmm. he had to try something different. But I think we've seen it. Did, it, it doesn't work. It's not a comfortable system for Sunderland. No. But the way they've set up now. It affords your defenders some. It, it, you know, they've got cover. It's allowing it allowed White to get the ball on Saturday. He didn't look as isolated as Grigg had been in previous weeks when they played just the one up front, and that was been that had been one one of the problems with that system. But he did seem more connected because Honeyman was was getting in and around and getting closer to him, mm-hmm. and and it worked very well. I mean, now whether he sets up like that at Peterborough, it's going to be interesting because. You know, Peterborough now will think, oh, are they going to do this? Are they going to sort of change their system? And because Peterborough played 4 4 2 at the weekend, um, it's interesting. But I just think, you know, it, it's a system that works, it's solid, and fingers crossed, now these last four games, it, 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 it just that momentum carries through. Yeah, there are certainly no glaring weaknesses in that team, I would say that much. And I think that team allows some of our players with some real quality to really show it. Now, Let's throw this one to you first of all, Johnny. If I if I was going to ask you, because it, 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 it's a lovely problem to have, a lovely problem to have, 
but it's difficult to choose man of the match in that game. And, and if we're in that position, then you know you, you know you're laughing. So if mm. you could pick a man of the match, Johnny, just based on that performance, who would you go for? Charlie Wyke. Charlie Wyke. Mm-hmm. Um, Why Charlie Wyke? Uh, the first half, I think. Anyway, I thought he was fantastic in the first half. Uh, assists goal, um, scored a goal. Obviously, anybody probably scored that if they you know it fell to their feet. But still, he scored the goal, and I think he was just um, a perfect League One forward almost. Mm-hmm. In the first half, in the second half, I felt it was quite flat from all over the park. I don't feel like Sunderland really done a lot. We didn't need to, obviously, at that point. Um, so I think overall, I'd go for White. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I think what you say there as well is quite interesting with them um, with the goal that he scored because you say there it was quite an easy one to to finish. But I don't I don't know if it was really. I think it was crucial when in the build up of that goal. I'm obviously you know done manages to win the ball, hits it over the keeper, but then it's. You know, mm-hmm. why we- really has a task there to defend off his mark. I think it's a top it in. player returning to form as well as a striker yeah. because yes. I think in past weeks he wouldn't have been there. Mm-hmm. He'd, yeah. have been, he'd have been back because yeah. you know, he'd have been tired and he wouldn't have. But he was, he was alert to the fact that that ball could break loose. And actually, if you watch it, when I first saw it live, I thought the ball from Dunn was actually heading over the line. I think it, actually, having seen it again, I think it was going past the post. So White mm-hmm. reacted very quickly to, to sort of wrap his foot around it and steer it back in. In, across the line, so yes. I think that was a, that was a sh- I thought that was a sharp finish. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I think what you say there is pretty spot on as well. Obviously, with you know with him with, with him coming back to form, there'll be a lot more confidence. And I think as is just the case with anything in life, when that confidence in your profession, in your sort of hobby, comes behind you, you get a lot more sort of like mental avenues opened up to you, as you say there. What? Perhaps when he when he's when he's injured, he's a bit lackadaisical. He's yeah. maybe not quite as sure of himself. He might not have made the run. He might not have been as sort of diligent looking for that ball. But now that he's in form, we can really see what he's about. We can see that he's got that positional awareness that you want from a target man, that he's got the ability to use his, his physicality and you know, and he can stay composed and he can tap the ball in because it was still quite a tight angle really. You know, I oh, think... well, it was a quite an acute angle. I think I think you know, as I say, it was a difficult angle and he was, and he had to react and get to the ball and knowing it might possibly break for him. I I I agree with Johnny. I mean it, I thought Charlie, if you had to pick a man of the match, probably was was, was the man. And I think I agree to the second half. They didn't pull up any trees, but I think that's quite interesting because talking to Ozturk afterwards, he he said they talked at half time, and they one of the things they talked about was look, we're quite happy for Doncaster to have the ball at that, mm-hmm. let them have it, you know, let them work it and tire themselves out because we're comfortable with breaking it up mm-hmm. at the other end. And the other thing that Jack Ross had said this last week was that the team had to become a little bit more alert to being in control of the match, managing the match from minute one to minute ninety, because there's been this problem where they've been. 15 minute burst at the start of the game where they looked quite good then they conceded a goal and they've lost control of the game yeah. I thought they controlled the game Saturday I think Completely. on Friday I think you know they, they were tuning up for half time the second half they didn't have to do anything because they, they were in they, they were making Doncaster do all the work and they were huffing and puffing and getting nowhere and even even doing that even sitting back and allowing Doncaster to do that work they still hit the post they still had a couple of other chances and it, as we said earlier it could have been four or five so I think that was the perfect, in a way, that was the perfect game for Jack Ross and for Sunderland. It was managed from the start to the finish. They kept a clean sheet and ultimately they got the, the three points and that was what was so critical. Yeah, yeah, I think that's um, that's on the nose. That's that's pretty spot on for me. So I was going to ask you as well, Nick, I was going to, after Johnny's man of the match, I was going to go to yours. I was hoping we could maybe bring in another player and talk about them, but if Charlie Wyke's your man of the match, well, I, then I, could you give me your second place? Second place, I mean, I think you, you've got to hand it to, to Dunn and Ozturk, and of the pair of them, I'd give it to Ozturk. Yes. I just thought because... I always liked you, Nick. Well, it just, <laughs> I just think for a player to um, be told the day before you're going to come back into the team at a time when they have to win, they've got to win these games... Mm-hmm. That's immense pressure on Ozturk as an individual, as a yeah. player who's played barely any games this season. You know, as he said afterwards, he played a couple of checker trade trophy games, but it's what was his last game? Wimbledon, something right way back at the beginning of the season. I think his last competitive game was with the Man City kids so, in the yeah, checker exactly. trade. So, if you can even call it that competitive you know, game, that, that's and on top of everything else, you're asking him to come in at the Stadium of Light, where there is probably more pressure on Sunderland's players than, than if he'd been put in the team at. At Doncaster or, or Warsaw or wherever, off so the back of in, a horrendous game exactly. as well. So to come in uh, and look as assured as he did, yeah, there, there was a couple of instances. The referee, I thought, was quite interesting. The pe- penalty incident, because a lot of people said to me that was a nailed-on penalty. I'm, I'm, I'm not so sure because the, the referee spoke to both of Ozturk and Butler about this sort of wrestling in the penalty area. Seconds later, 
Butler goes down. I just thought that was too easy. Mm -hmm. And I can see why the referee didn't give it. And I watched the replay. I mean, if you watch Butler, he's on his way down. He is. I thought he's died for that. Okay, Ozturk's culpable because he has got his arms around him. But I thought Butler, he knew exactly what he was doing. He was playing for that. I think that's why the referee didn't give it. Mm. What was your initial reaction of that, Johnny? Because I think I'm, I'm, I'm of a similar mind here. I think, obviously, Ozturk isn't entirely innocent because he is grappling Butler a bit. But then equally, Butler Butler is, if you look at the way he's like shifting his body, he's looking for it. He was. I think, well, watching the replay, I saw that, and clearly he did go down first, and then Ostok just fell on him. But when I watched it live at the time, I, was think, I, I, I wasn't I was sure. I mean, a referee in League One, I was half expecting to give it because like that sort of decision, it's, it's 50-50. I feel like maybe the referee could have given it. And I don't know, I mean, watching it live... It was just like, how's he got away with that? Um, that's how I felt at the time. Yeah, in, in the moment. He looked quite clumsy, and I thought, oh, no, here we go. But the referee didn't give it, and I thought maybe the ref actually made the wrong decision there, but then watching the replay, actually, that was a very good call. I think, <laughs> well, actually, it's a, I mean, credit to the referee on Friday, because yeah, I was we've had that. some poor referees this season. But actually, um, Andy Warmer let the game flow on, on Friday on the whole. There were a couple of sort of iffy challenges, but... It was late on before he, he pulled the card. I mean, Catamol, look, you can't complain about that card. Oh, I mean, he'd already been warned five, ten minutes earlier because he'd made a challenge in the middle and, and the referee had had a word with him. And then that the, the challenge he got the yellow card for, he was late. I mean, he took, he, it was a, a poor challenge. And then, it, you know, the uh, Doncaster yellow card again, it was a stupid challenge and it was a yellow card. But other than that, Andy Woolmer did try and let the game flow and there wasn't a lot of uh, niggle in, in the game. Um and, that, and I think you know. I think he was spot on with that penalty, not giving the penalty for once. The referee, I think this is something that Jack Ross has spoken about in the season. So often this season, the referees have made a knee-jerk reaction straight away. They haven't mm-hmm. taken ten seconds to think about it. I think Andy Wilm was good on Saturday, on Friday because he had spoken to the two players about that very instance incident that had then happened, and he took ten seconds to think about it and look at it and think, no, that wasn't mm-hmm. a penalty. Yeah, I think a lot of referees could really. Sorry, I, I, I really, I, I'm really happy that we're going to sort of give referees in League One praise for once. What did you say his name was, Nick? I think it was Andy Warmer. Andy Warmer. Well, I wanted to take a moment to say that I thought, yeah, Andy Warmer had a very good game. I thought, as as a referee, I think he, he did he did brilliantly yesterday. I think, and as you say, I think a lot of referees could take a leaf out of Andy's book there. Having that sort of time to reflect on the sort of the situation. I mean, I, I'm I'm no referee, but being able to assess a situation. Just maybe with a moment of reflection can well, make all the difference. I, I, mean, I think it's difficult the, as well. Yeah. We've got thirty-five thousand people in the stadium as well, and, and you know the atmosphere was good. And that's the first game this season that Andy Warmer's refereed Sunderland, and it's at, at the Stadium mm-hmm. of Light. So you know, I think people forget there is as, as much as we talk about pressure on the players. Sometimes there's pressure on a lot of these referees, and a lot of these referees are relatively inexperienced. Mm-hmm. And certainly for your first game of the season it turns out to be the Stadium of Light in front of 35,000 people and there's a lot riding on it I thought he actually had a very good game yeah, very did. calm collected very much so I think there's definitely not again we'll not, we'll not name any names because I can't be bothered to having petty digs of referees but there's a, there's a, there, there are a lot and in the extremely um, remote chance they're listening to the Roker Report podcast yeah, yeah. Be like Andy. <laughs> yeah, honestly, it was just it was good. But anyway, back to our sort of man of the match choices. Now we've had Charlie Wyke from Johnny, and after a bit of coercion, we've got Alan Masterk from Emma from Nick because we can't couldn't have two Charlies there. But for me, um, I wouldn't go for either. I, I was very tempted to go with McGeady again, but I think on reflection, I want to give it to Brian Oviedo. I think Oviedo had a fantastic game. He had a good game against Coventry. You know, in 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 a game with with very few positives, I thought he was very bright against Coventry, and I thought he was great again uh, on Friday. I think he was just very sort of obviously d- defensively, he's just very sort of like aware and very conscientious. So he can you know he can time a tackle perfectly, and he can pick out a pass. He can make a run. He can find the overlap, and he can pick out a cross. And he really just fits Jack Ross's style of play. And I would be really upset if he wasn't here next season. But obviously, you, you never know. But especially, I think I think had he have scored that goal in the second half, I think he would have been a lot of more people. I think he could have been a lot more of a shoe in. I think at, at the moment, well, I, think, I think there's a thin yeah. slither of paper in between everybody at the moment because I think yeah. there's a justifiable case for McGeady as well, bearing in mind the pain he's playing through at the minute, and and you can see. You can see what he brings to the table, mm-hmm. and imagine if he was fully fit at the moment. But instead, he's playing as he is and putting out, you know, some some lovely football. 
with ex- apparently extraordinary levels of pain, and that's even taking mm-hmm. pain relief. There, yeah, there were a lot of mitigating factors for other choices in Man of the Match. As you say there, McGeady allegedly, you know, I mean, Jack Ross didn't seem from his press as confident at all that McGeady would feature. He said that we brought him into the team against Coventry when probably shouldn't have. And that, to me, struck me as maybe like a bit of a, a, bit of a panic substitution, given the nature of the game. But obviously, McGeady has want, I mean, McGeady has shown the willing to play despite... The pain he's obviously well, I think even physical pain he's in. Was Ill, in. Well, yeah, the, again, he's another one, Wyke, and I think that up. again. I mean, we say it all the time now, but I'm really glad that we can say it. It's, it's a testament to the character of the team. I think there's a lot to be said for that. And I think Oviedo is one of the is, is part of that as well because Oviedo suffered. Uh, I think clearly with this, the breakdown of that move to West Brom mm-hmm. in January, and that did affect him. I think it affected him mentally. It affected him to a certain extent. He did have a calf injury, but I think it's one of those we we're talking about McGeady playing through the pain barrier. You're talking about White playing after being ill. I think Oviedo was one of those little calf injuries he probably could have played, but I just I think Jack felt he just wasn't mentally there. Oh. But the last few weeks, I think he's reined him in again. I think that's mm. one thing that people forget about Jack Ross. One thing he's done this season, his man management has been absolutely fantastic. So I mean, good. he's brought McGeady back into the fold. He's managed Oviedo. He's been managing Baldwin and Flanagan. He's managed Ozter. You name it. He's mm-hmm. he's actually and if you talk to the players individually they have got nothing but praise for Jack Ross I mean mm-hmm. Jack, Jack Baldwin a fortnight ago was saying how when he was dropped from the team the first thing Jack Ross did was talk to him explain his decisions and Baldwin didn't have an issue with it didn't have a problem with that I think Oster if you speak to Oster it would be the same thing he hasn't got any issues because Jack Ross has managed him if you like has, has kept him in the fold mm-hmm. and McGeady a masterstroke because we've all seen Sunderland till I die and how critical McGeady was of Chris Coleman he wasn't overly a, a fan of Simon Grayson, and there's a you know he could have really made life difficult for Jack Ross, but he hasn't. Mm-hmm. Ross has made him feel that he's an integral part of the team. He's got a role to play. He's given him some responsibility, and McGee has embraced it and he's yeah. really taken it on board. And I think that's that's you know people don't sometimes see that side of, of managing in in what is undeniably I think a really difficult season for any manager. The pressure that Jack Ross is under, mm-hmm. and he knows he's under to get this team promoted at the first attempt. Because I think Stuart Donald, we had a conversation actually with Jack about this the other week, Stuart Donald probably actually, when you look at the way he's talked about the season, probably didn't believe they're going to go up this season. I mean, they might not still, but you know, the odds are they probably will. Um, so I think even Jack Ross is, 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 is sort of, um, for, for Stuart Donald, has sort of basically uh, surprised and confounded all his expectations. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I yeah, I think I think that's it. I think man management has been absolutely essential. I think when this team was initially formed under Jack Ross, there would have been a lot of heads that were elsewhere. Like McGeady, he'll know as well as any of us that he shouldn't be in League One. He shouldn't be playing this level. He's far too good for it. He should never have been here. But here he is. Brian Oviedo, I would argue, is the same. Obviously, you know, he's had a lot. He's had a lot more sort of like to turn his head than McGeady has, but. You've you've really just got to hold your hand up, and you've got to. It's a, it's a testament to Ross as a manager that he can keep these players together as a cohesive whole, and it's well, it's a testament to the players for just keeping their heads down and working hard in spite of adversity. All of these, there are players where we've got this season that if we had them two seasons ago, would say they had all the hallmarks of a mercenary. Would have had yeah. players, we you know. I mean, we're only three seasons ahead of uh, of Lamine Corney's random bad back injuries. You know, of of Adnan Yanazai photoshop on the club's badge out of his Instagram photos. You know, we've had some players who just really had no time whatsoever for for Sunderland. And you know, if the if the head could be turned, it was turned like that. It was yeah. just. I, it, it, I mean, it's, it's, and it, it is an outstanding group of players. And look, look with. We're forgetting here as well, John McLaughlin. I think he's been one of the unsung heroes this season. I mean, oh, he's been, absolutely. Uh, you know, he's been so solid at the back. Um, that, that, and that, that's, you know, in a sense, is where it all stems from. You get the, you look at all the problems we had last season with the goalkeepers, and, and that's where the problems began. You know, that mm-hmm. if it's just you've got no confidence in your goalkeeper, then the defenders had no confidence, and then it ran through the side. Yeah, okay. McLaughlin's looked so strong at the back. That it's given you know everyone else that sort of uh, that confidence through yeah, the team. It's almost given the team that foundation from which yeah. the rest of the sort of the mentality has been built on. It's it's really yeah. it's crucial. But yeah, it's um, I think I, I want to as well just before we move on. I, I want to just maybe give one more plaudit to or to Oviedo just because of the the nature of where he's come from. He's one of the players. Now he was brought in amid the Moyes era. He's from the Moyes culture. He was one of the Moyesian players who were brought in and who were introduced to his fellow Everton teammates upon arrival. And we're allegedly not introduced to the rest. You know, he's from a very, he's, he's from, he's from Moyes' 
little defeatist clique, and I think he had. I wouldn't have been surprised if he'd been like like Les Scott or like Yanis I etc. One of these, but but he he's been with the club now through a lot of adversity. You know, he's been with us through two relegations, and you haven't heard a peep from him, have you? No, no there's, he, there's not he, been. He, a, he is an incredibly likable guy, actually. There hasn't been a single whisper um, of any. Uh, well, there's, there's also um, one other conversation we've had this season about Oviedo is that. Oviedo's too good for, for League One. Mm-hmm. Um, and sometimes that's an issue for players who are Championship or Premier League quality. They struggle actually to play in League One because it's just not, it's completely out of their comfort yeah. zone. But he's actually tried to adapt to Oviedo. And I think, you know, he's, he's done that without making a big noise about it. A funny thing about Oviedo as well, I mean, I'm talking about characters. Apparently, I mean, you probably know the story, but when they were on the team bus one day, John Potter over, was looking over his shoulder at Oviedo's iPad and it's a picture of a cow on it. And oh, what? what a, a cow. A cow. Oh, right. And and it's like, what, what on earth are you? And it turns out that Oviedo is a, a rancher and a cow farmer in Costa Rica. <laughs> I and didn't he, know and that. He was buying a cow. Oh, is, so it's uh, that's nice. So it's got this sort of this sort of almost uh, almost domesticated side to him, which is actually yeah. sort of, he's nurturing his sort of his ranch in Costa Rica with all his cows and buying cows on the. On the team bus to wherever they're going, and but he actually genuinely is a um, a very likable, down to earth, very down to earth guy. Yeah, that's unreal. I didn't know that. No. Oh well, hey, the more you know, fantastic. <laughs> oh well. So when you talked about a calf injury, this it, yeah, it's nothing to do with his legs. <laughs> well, Brian, if you keep this up and you keep if you keep putting in these great performances, I will buy you your next livestock for your farm. Well, of course, you have the, my Jack word. Ross gets a goat, doesn't he, every time? <laughs> oh yeah, win a game. He does. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But yeah, no, Brian, name me your farm animal. I'll get you one. No, no worries, man. Don't worry about that. Anyway, you so, saw the, there was saw there was um, a Costa Rica flag. There was a couple of Costa Rica oh, flags down, at the, the game. In the dugout, wasn't yeah, there? yeah, yeah. I wonder Spanish who they were and Costa Rica flag, wasn't it together? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, the railing. Yeah, and I, I think as well, I, I said it, I think, very briefly, but had that goal have gone in the second half, you know... Oh, it would have been a lovely e- goal. Ex- excellent run, lovely hit, you know, agonisingly hits the post and goes out. I think he was probably a, he was probably a, a, a toe in the door for man of the match. I think had he scored that, it would have been a size well, 10 Well, there was another Martin. point, he, um, he lost the ball, but he trapped back and made the, and, and got the ball back off. I think, was it Wilkes? It was a fantastic tackle, because it was in the penalty area, he had to get it absolutely right, and, and it was just perfect. Yeah, it was. It was just it, it was just a great game all round. I've really got nothing negative to say. I think the defence was resolute. I think, as you've said before, um, Ozturk and... Well, Ozturk and Dunn, more so Ozturk. All ironic venerations aside, great testament to his character that after being left out in the cold for virtually all season, he's come back in in such a crucial game where the fans could have turned on that game, where they could have been very... They would have, they would have been very reluctant to see such a radical change in the team sheet and he's come in and he's just done no nonsense centre back duties you know he's just him and Dunn have resolved everything Oviedo's been great or has been great again Catamol provided great cover Power was solid Honeyman played the camera roll very effectively as I said breaking up play very good off the ball and then you've got Morgan McGeady and then Wyke who despite being allegedly ill played a very good game so yeah, all in all, it's great. So with that in mind, I'll throw this one to you first of all, Johnny. We're going to bring in our quick question now. And I also, I ran a Twitter poll. And while you're talking, I'm going to bring this up on the screen because I like to use my time efficiently. But, yeah, so how would you change the team for Peter Johnny if you would at all? What are your thoughts going into that game? Because obviously we've had a very solid performance, but is there anything that we could do or anything that we shouldn't do in order to ensure that we get another comprehensive win? Well, I think, obviously, if you look at the previous roles of uh, Flanagan and Baldwin, they've played a lot of games, um, games that have come very, very quickly, and I think maybe you want to keep the defenders the way they are because they've obviously shown how solid they can be, and I think just a no-nonsense defence rather than defenders trying to spray the ball about yep, agree. like Flanagan would do. If you just keep it the way it is, in defence, I think you should keep it... Um, just, I mean, I think it's fine. Uh, don't uh, tamper with it because it's worked. And Peterborough are in the same position as Doncaster, so I'm, you know, I'm, I'd like to think that if we can keep a clean sheet against Doncaster, seventh place Peterborough should be able to keep a clean sheet against as well. Logically, you would hope so, wouldn't um, you? McGeady, if he's injured, if he's gone through a lot of pain, I probably would take him out just and uh, maybe bring him on in the second half. If he's if he's injured, I just, uh, I know obviously he can have a bit of magic about him, but I'd rather have a fully fit McGeady. Mm-hmm for the last three games perhaps so take him out put him on the bench and bring mm-hmm. somebody else in maybe 
Gooch, who I don't particularly rate, by the way, but I mean, at least it's somebody who's fully fit. So yeah, yeah, um, and maybe keep the the midfield uh, besides that uh, the way it is, and then have White up front again. Mm-hmm. I think I think I'm quite happy with the way it was, and I think if it's worked, then just stick with it. Mm-hmm. We'll so. go to you in a second, Nick. But yeah, I think what you say there, Johnny, spot on. I think good character is good character, and we all love that from Bagheera that he's played on, despite perhaps you know perhaps the, the 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 physical discomfort he's in but uh, an, an unfit player is an unfit player ultimately and a fit mm. player is a fit player and you'd, you'd want McGeady you know like firing all cylinders rather than perhaps struggling to get through yet another game in such a short space of time but our quick question of this week was essentially what we've just said there is how would what would you change for Peter Brett and what would you keep the same and why so the first two questions that we had that I've highlighted here one's from Martin Findlay who says no don't change anything didn't look broken to me, so don't try to fix it. Best we've played in a while. And Robert Barber says, keep the team and the shape. Honeyman pressing away from home is essential with Maguire an impact option from the bench. So what do you think, Nick? Is it a case of, if it ain't broke, don't fix it? Uh, to, a, to a large extent, yes. And I, I, I agree with Johnny, though. I think the McGeady question is, is important because he is playing with a, a lot of pain. And I think, you know, at what point do you say that's enough? You, you can't keep doing that without suffering more or you know, exacerbating the injury. Mm-hmm. It's not a. It's not an injury that is, as I understand it, it's not a broken bone or anything. But it's a bone that's actually, it can, you can play with it. But the, the consequence of playing is the pain. Right. That's the problem. Um, and it's how much McGeady's prepared to put up with that pain. Um, I think Jack Ross sort of hinted last week before the Doncaster game that Gooch, it would probably be too soon for him against Doncaster but he would be fit for Peterborough. Mm-hmm. I've got a funny feeling that Johnny's probably right. I think Gooch might well come in for McGeady at Peterborough. Um, Gooch's problem is his decision-making. Absolutely. It, it, it just hasn't learned yet when to lay the ball off, when he gets into really good positions around the penalty area. But he is an outlet, and I can see that away from home, um, using using Gooch in that role could be quite effective. Mm-hmm. But other than that, I'm, I'm largely agreeing with everybody. It was it, It's... You know, why change a winning team? The only other question mark over it would be that it's the it's the two games in four days scenario. But look, Peterborough have, have got the same problems. So both teams are in the same boat in that respect. Um, and I think the luxury that Sunderland have got now as well is that Maguire is back. He's there on the bench. And I thought it was interesting. They, didn't, they weren't tempted to throw him in on Saturday, which is great because they didn't need to. So it's kept him... Absolutely, you know they've given him sort of another mm. game to get sort of up to speed, if you like, or fit. Uh, and what a player to have on the bench as an impact player if you need him, yeah. certainly away from home. Absolutely. So I think you know they they and if McGeady doesn't play, he's on the bench. Maguire's on the bench. Suddenly you've certainly you you've got a Sterling on the bench. You've got options mm-hmm. now to change games with that with the substitutions that he can make. Um, but going back to the initial question. Would he change it? Why change a winning team? I think it might just be the one change, if any at all. Mm-hmm. I, I think I'm tempted to agree. I think, obviously, while that team is good, there are players in that team who are nursing injuries and playing with them, and you'd rather perhaps give them a game to play without, owing to the fact that we have enough quality to to compensate for them not being in the team. But interestingly, along a similar, along a similar line with the quick question, Craig Jackson says, if no injuries, no way he will change, but Maguire for Honeyman would be the obvious change. How do we think about obvious? I mean, I I definitely agree to an extent. I think, thinking along Craig's lines, I would agree that Maguire is a more natural cam than Honeyman. But would you take Honeyman straight out from Maguire? No, only because Maguire... I, I, he's, he's the most natural number 10 that Sunderland have got, if you like. But he's been out for eight weeks. Yep. So, I, whatever way you look at it, um, he's just he has got no match fitness in the last... He's been out for two months. He He's not going to... I'd be very surprised... If he starts the game, it's going to be for an hour. Mm-hmm. But I'm I'm more inclined to think Maguire's going to come on. He'll play 30 minutes, get him up to speed. Then, mm. uh, then if needs be, he's, I mean Maguire could be very very important for Portsmouth. Yeah, because I think that Portsmouth game is going to be the, the crux of whether they go up automatically or, or in the playoffs. Psychologically as well, that's a huge game and you want a big personality on the pitch, especially in Maguire's case. You want a personality and because Portsmouth they are a big had, yeah. team. They're a big, mm-hmm. bullying, imposing mm-hmm. team. We've seen that, and we know when they play as well as they can do, second half at Wembley and in, in the game at Fratton Park, when they're on their game, they're big and they're strong, and Sunderland needs someone like Maguire, who 
actually relishes that sort of combat. You know, he likes. To, we yeah. saw him. Remember him at Bradford. I mean, that was for me. Maguire. It, it, he was sort of the it, Bradford City away encompassed everything that was good about Maguire. He gets in the opposition faces. He gets hold of the ball. He ruffles people up. And that's just what Portsmouth players do. So that's I think Maguire could have an important play oh, role to yeah. play beyond Peterborough. Hey, oh, he's a he's a he's a right sort of like you know in your face kind of player. And I think as well for the Portsmouth game, I don't know what you think, Johnny, but Maguire for Portsmouth, as far as I'm aware, is a fairly unknown quantity. They've not had, they haven't had he wasn't written into the team plan in the Czech Trade Trophy. How crucial would um would he be in the running? Do you think perhaps if he was rested from I Peterborough think- onwards? I think it'd be very important. I think, um, but that's just for every game. He, you, just, you saw the impact he made against Accrington, and I know he was a bit off form for a bit. But since he's been away from uh, the team for such a long time, he'll be raring to go. He'll be wanting to show what uh, we've missed with with uh, Maguire. And I think against Portsmouth, he'll be well up for it. Yeah, he knows what's at stake, and I think he's uh, one of those key players that you need at this stage of the season. So, mm-hmm. um, but I do think give him another game to rest up. I think in regards to the Honeyman situation as well, I think he was pretty poor by um, the player's standards at the weekend, I'd, I'd say. Do you think so? I think he was okay. I mean, I think if you want to replace him with anybody, you replace him with Ledbert, though not with Maguire. Like, from the start, anyway, I don't think you yeah. want to start with Maguire. Like, I don't know if Ledbert could play that high up, though, could he? Because Honeyman played like a cam, didn't he? I don't think he could play. Mm, could you yeah. play Ledbert at that high up? Well, I mean, he doesn't have the pace really. I mean, neither does. I don't know if Honeyman has a lot of pace, but he's no. got energy. I think the thing yeah. about Honeyman, you watched him on, yeah. on Friday. He was on the left. He was on the right. He was in yeah. the middle. He was back yeah. defending mm-hmm. because he's got he's got incredible energy levels, which he can sustain for ninety minutes. Which I think is something that you know um, there there are a lot of people criticise Honeyman, but Honeyman is playing now arguably at his mm-hmm. level, maybe yes. lower Championship League One level, but that's where that's where a player like Honeyman will thrive. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, he compensates for his lack of height with, with the what he brings to the. Again, you see, I go back to that game at Bradford where Maguire had such a good game. Honeyman came on in that game and did exactly the same thing. He disrupted, he held the ball up, and he was actually as as important as anybody in that game to, to seeing that game out and winning it. Um, you know, when they were playing with ten men as well. So, I think you know, Honeyman does a lot of um, a lot of things that people don't really pick up on. And, and criticise him for it. And, you know, he's, he's labelled as Jack Ross's favourite. But I think you've got to give Jack Ross some credit here and accept that Jack, Jack Ross does seem to know what he's doing. Mm-hmm. And he wouldn't just put the Honeyman in there for the sake of it because he's his captain. I think mm-hmm. there's a very good reason why Honeyman is in the team from, from Jack Ross's perspective. Yeah. yeah, Jack Ross won't just play a player on merit that he was given captain, captaincy at the start of the season. If he'd got if he'd got so far in the season and it just wasn't working out, he'd be dropped and he wouldn't well, look come back. Look at Baldwin and Flanagan. Look at Don Love. And, 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 yeah, yeah, Love... Uh, and Maguire to a certain extent. Yeah. If, if they're not doing what he wants them to do, they're out. And, yeah. and he had, and, and he's no compunction to do that. Absolutely. Well, like well, Greg, obviously he's you know the the record signed in League One and whatnot, and he was on the bench this week. It shows that if he needs to drop him, he will. Yeah, because yeah. that's what you need to do. And he was very ruthless at the weekend and paid off. Thankfully, uh, it's one of those calculated risks, isn't it? I wouldn't yeah. be at all surprised. We were shown the stats for the amount of ground covered on. Friday by the, by the individual players, Honeyman will be up there right at the top because yeah. that's the other thing we forget. You know, they're all got they're, they're all got their GPS on and everything else, and mm. they do look very sort of uh, they quite rigidly sort of address those statistics in the week in training and see how much ground people are covering and what their levels are and so on and so on, passing mm. and etc. I'd, I'd be surprised if Honeyman isn't one of the highest when it comes to distance covered in a game. Yeah, I, I think I think that if I had to say one thing about perhaps about Honeyman is that. I would say he's certainly better off the ball than he is on it. I think his, I think he's he's got a, a his, the weak, the weakest aspect of his game. I would say is perhaps his, his passing's okay. I think it's it's retaining the ball it's when he's reta- on it. Yeah, he, he does lose it. Quite I think easily. He's, and... he's he's not he's not so much bullied off the ball as he just sort of like takes an like an, an, an odd, uh, a dodgy touch and then he's dispossessed. It's it's more just maybe that like dexterity on the ball, that sort of like movement, like when he's like dri- and he's not the kind of player that could dribble. I don't think Honeyman not at all, but. You know, he's got that aboutness. He's got that energy, and yeah, well, he can you stretch. Know. He's the sort of player that stretches defenses. He does. He does. And that's where Sunderland have got to, you know, play to their strengths. You mm. want to get White through and involved. You know, that's that's you need a Honeyman there to sort of pull players away from White. And it was interesting on Friday how much, how many times in the second half, especially when McLaughlin is kicking, looking for White, White actually found himself in quite a lot of space to win the header, and and was losing his centre half that was mm-hmm. trying to pick him up. 
which you know in, in past weeks the the Wyke has you know been battling having sort of some right royal battles with the centre half. I actually yeah. fact saw him on Friday finding himself in quite a quite a lot of space in the second half. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think ultimately it, it's going to just. You know, in summary, it's going to boil down to just fitness. I think that's the only reason why any changes will be made. It is a case if a day and broke, don't fix it. And Jack Ross isn't wanting to make radical changes without without cause. So it will just be a case of if the likes of Wyke or McGeady, if they if they really if if I, if Ross or themselves really felt like they couldn't play, I think they'll try and play because that's the nature of who they are in this team and who they are with this manager. But if it's just too much, it's too much. And ultimately, you, you want a fit player rather than a, a, a fit player with an asterisk because they're playing on in pain. But we'll just reel it in there. I'm just going to bring this segment to an end. We've got another segment coming up in a second, which we'll get into uh, in, in, in approximately a minute's time. But just to reel it all in, I just wanted to talk about perhaps centre-back pairings because when we spoke to Danny Collins last week, he had a lot of reservations about taking out two centre-backs and putting two in. But to Ross's credit, you know, obviously he's got... Um, uh, he's got you know, he's got an absolute pair of grapefruits to do it because <laughs> I don't think I could have done it if it was me. But he's he's took out the same, he's took out Baldwin and Flanagan and he's put in Dunn and Ozturk, you know, out of the blue. But I asked on Twitter, I made a poll, um, again, informally, not for the purpose of the pod, but it works pretty well here. I'll bring it in. So, yeah, well, no, two days ago now, I asked on Twitter, do you keep the same centre-back pairing for Peterborough? 84% said yes, straight up. 13% no, take out Ozturk. 1% said no take out done and 2% said no take out both. So it's, you know, it's just short of a unanimous call that we should keep Dunn and Ozturk in. And I think, you know, obviously unless that they do maybe flag up a weakness in the in the Peterborough game, then we're good with that. You know, we, again, referencing Danny Collins, he told us that the no-nonsense centre-back is what you want from League One. Someone who can read the game, get rid of the ball, be aware of who's around him. And they've done that just fine for me. Some exchange betting companies run short-lived promotions, like months-long offers of low commission. At BetDAC, we wanted to change the way we did things, so we set our commission at 2% permanently. That's 2% on football, horse racing, golf, almost any sport. 2%. That's just one way that BetDAC is changing for the better. For the better, like you. BetDAC, the 2% commission exchange. Over 18s only, please gamble responsibly. What I would like us to do now is, first of all, I would like to introduce a fourth person in the room with us, because uh, hitherto I have not done that. We are joined today in the Roker Report podcast studio by the author of Give Us Tomorrow Now, a book about Alan Durbin, David Snowden. How are you doing, David? Not too bad, thank you. Good stuff. So, David, basically... I thought today would be quite an opportune time to talk about the, your book on Alan Durbin, just um, owing to the fact that it could perhaps be considered quite relevant to the situation Jack Ross maybe finds himself in with fan expectations. But obviously, just to maybe give a synopsis of, first of all, Alan Durbin's time at Sunderland, because there'll be a lot of listeners in Roker Report who perhaps won't remember Durbin. I mean, give me, for example, my first game was um, 2003. So, you know, I was um, quite... I was born in 97, you know, like the, the, the Alan Durbin era, the 80s were, were, were beyond me. So just to perhaps enlighten the listeners at home and even myself, really, can you tell us about what Alan Durbin's tenure was like at Sunderland? Well, um, he arrived in the summer of 81. Um, Ken Knighton had left, um, had been sacked in the April. Um, and Sunderland had stayed, managed to stay in the top flight on the last day of the season with the win at Liverpool. Um, now they're... Alan Durbin was the chairman's first choice, I believe, and it was very rare, uh, certainly in my experience of following Sunderland Football Club at, a, at that age, that uh, and, and, and even older people than me, for Sunderland to actually uh, be successful in securing their first choice, the, 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 the man at the top of the list for mm-hmm. to be manager. And Alan Durbin had a reputation of working on a shoestring um, not splashing cash out unnecessarily, um, bringing on younger players um, and, and bringing in older heads to, to, to augment the team. And I think this, this appealed greatly to the regime that was in, in place at the time at Sunderland. Um, and he, and he, he came in, um, he was given initially uh, some money to spend because we, um, again, we... We broke the transfer record um, f- for the club. We signed um, in the August, a week before the season, um, Ali McCoist, who was the the hot 
described as the hot shot, the goal scoring sensation. There were about five other clubs in for his uh, signature, and he chose mm-hmm. Sunderland. And yeah. this, again, this was a se- another example of uh, it was unusual to, for Sunderland to uh, be successful in in going for their first choice target, and everything seemed set fair, and we perhaps uh, over. Achieved early on with the first two or three matches, um, beating the drawing away to the league runners up uh, Ipswich, beating the reigning league champions Aston Villa at Roker Park on our first game of the season. Um, but then I think reality uh, kicked in. Um, the squad was not strong, um, and then as the 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 1980s, early 80s, the economy uh, took a downturn. This Reflected, um, had a knock-on effect in football. Um, so all of a sudden, Alan Durban found that even to find seventy-five thousand pounds or a hundred thousand pounds for a for a, for a prospective new signing, he was not given the cash. We had a a quality because Alan Durban um, was always seeking quality. He um, had Jimmy Nickel, a, a Northern Ireland uh, international, in the prime of his career, but with that experience at a top club. Um, at about, I think he was 24, 25 years old, and he was on loan, and we weren't able to complete the the, the transfer, um, at which was a modest, relatively modest, two hundred thousand pounds, and that was what it had come to. We we were taking um, non-league players on trial basis, um, and on on a part uh, a pay, pay as you play sort of arrangement with their with their non-league club. Um, so it was a tremendous achievement. It was. A, it was a. I mean, I describe it in the book. It's. A, it's, a, it's a minor miracle. Uh, when we we put a run together, we seemed, the club seemed dead and gone and destined for the second division mm-hmm. after a, a disastrous um, defeat in a Wigatees derby at the start of April. So there was only six weeks of the season to go, but there had been a winter backlog. So there was a lot of games. Um, to be played still relatively for that for that later month of the season, and we there was a clear the air meeting. Um, New, New, Colin West was came to team with partner Gary Rowell. The, the goals um, started to come. Um, the defence tightened up, which was always a, a prime concern of Alan Durban. A, mm-hmm. a nice clean sheet. Uh, we can't win if we don't keep a clean sheet. Generally speaking, um, and we we stayed up on the last day of the season. Um, now the second season were at a stark contrast. There was no money to spend. Um, the former Bank of England club, as they were known in the nineteen fifties, were reduced to signing. We we signed a very good player, uh, Ian Atkins, who went on to captain the team, um, but he was signed for a, a, a bargain. Um, I think it was forty thousand pounds plus striker Alan Brown in part exchange, and little did the supporters realise that. During that summer, that was going to be our only purchase. Um, again, the, there was a, a little bit of improvement in the second season, but again, it was a struggle. Um, we, although he didn't particularly want to um, go for older players, um, it was we reached the stage where Frank Worthington, 34-year-old, uh, was available for a modest fee, and he was brought in on a short-term basis. The, um, at, with Sunderland lying at the bottom of the league in December, the again a transformation started to take place. It was supplemented because there was another shrewd buy, Leighton James. T- I say buy, it was a free transfer. Leighton James arrived, a, a Welsh international, experienced, 29 years old, um, from uh, Swansea City. Uh, the improvement uh, continued, and we. We seem to be getting ourselves out of uh, relegation bother a little bit earlier. It still went to the last because at Sunderland Football Club it's very rare uh, to be devoid of drama. It, it went. It did go to the end end of the season, um, but th- this was a point where I think Alan Durban, the, the, the realities were kicking home with the supporters. They, they realised that Alan Durban wasn't being given the money to to radically. Improve the team and a sacrifice. The the midfield needed to be rebuilt. Um, Paul Bracewell, his former player at Stoke, was available, 21 years old. We had Mark Proctor, who had spent a month on loan the previous season. I think he was 22. Uh, but they had both 
relatively young, young, but had 100 plus league, um, league matches under their belt in the top division. Mm -hmm. um, Bracewell had captain Stoke City, but unfortunately, to secure, to rebuild, to galvanise his midfield department, um, Durban reluctantly uh, had to sell one player, one of the players, and we didn't have many who would generate cash, and that was Ali McCoist. Um, so we, that was done. McCoy went to Rangers. We we all know what happened there. It didn't wasn't instant instant success. It, it did take him a while, um, uh, two or three years before he um, reached his um, you know his, his maturity and came into his own. But um, Bracewell and Proctor, the midfield was was secure and uh, we did improve. Um, here, here is a, a major change with today's game. The squad that Durban was working with was probably 16 strong at a push. Um, it's tiny. We, we had um, Pop Robson, our first team coach. He was doubling up as our reserve striker. If, if anything happened to Gary Rowell or Colin West, yeah, put, don't get me wrong, Pop Robson was a very able, more than able uh, replacement, but he was. Uh, pushing 38 years old, mm -hmm. but that was the that was um, the state that w really Sunderland were in, in the, and also in this season, Leighton James he was doubling up as the youth team coach, um, so it was a very um, small squad. There was, um, I think, the, I think the silent majority of supporters could see the improvement. Uh, regrettably, um, the cup. This uh, mania for for cup success seemed to uh, preoccupy the mm -hmm. thoughts of many in the boardroom and a minority. I would say I, I would say a minority of supporters. So when there was a there seemed to be a good prospect of progress in the FA Cup, we had a a fourth round home tie against Birmingham City at the end of January, and one leading one nil, uh, it all went pear shaped in the final ten minutes. Um, we lost, Sunderland lost 2-1, um, and I think Durban realised then that the, the writing was on the wall because we had, a, we had a, an awfully tough fixture list to negotiate in the February. I think we were playing five out of the top seven teams, and we did suffer a couple of defeats, but it wasn't, a, and it wasn't an abject disaster. And at the, at the start of March, uh, we, were about, we had two home matches coming up, and... I think we were sitting approximately 13th in the league. Um, things didn't seem too bad, but uh, on the eve of these two matches, Alan Durban was sacked, and the timing of the sacking seemed most peculiar, um, not only given our position in the league, which was not parlous by any stretch of the imagination, but it was also on the Friday morning prior to... Saturday and a Wednesday home match, uh, two home matches coming up, which it, it it smacked to the outside observer that Alan Derwin was not going to be given the opportunity to post four points or six points out of six and keep his position. It seemed that somebody on high wanted him out and uh, and he was sacked. And I think a lot of people became wise... In hindsight, um, there's, I mean, Paul Hetherington, who was a guest on, on your podcast a few weeks ago, I, I quote him in, uh, towards the tail end of my book. He wrote a very incisive piece and said, uh, um, you know, a lot, a lot of people of, of acquired vision um, after the event, or, or I'm paraphrasing him. Um, and I think that is the general impression I've received uh, over latter years where people, um, the, as I say, I've described him as a silent majority. Some realised at the time that, that he was um, improving the situation. And in a way, it's frustrating that our, my generation, somebody in their, say, late 40s, early 50s, feel as if they were denied uh, a golden period of success. Um, because these are the times, I mean, for you lads, probably in your early 20s, yeah. These times that they, they become lasered into your brain, into the hard disk. They, they, they're very vivid memories, and it, great. It's it's fine to have success uh, 
when you're following the club in your 30s and 40s. But I, th I think there's nothing like um, uh, success being achieved in youth. And men, I quote um, instances of men like Howard Kendall at Everton being given the time. They were on the verge of possibly being sacked. And a little cup run saved how arguably saved Howard Kendall and the following season there was League Championship Cup Winners' mm -hmm. Cup um, so in a way um, it's it's a it's a, I suppose it's a classic story I'm not saying it's a unique story it's a, it might be a, but it's a classic story of what might have been Did Alan have a, a fractious relationship with the board then because you mentioned the, the previous season he'd sort of be, he'd, he'd kept it well there was a summit meeting if you like and he survived that it, 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 was there always a an air, perhaps, of the the board not really being a hundred percent behind him and and, yeah. and looking for an excuse. I think it developed in the summer of eighty three, and and that's when McCoy. I think he's. I think there was something in the air then. McCoy was released um, because I think, to some extent, possibly Durban had an inkling that he wouldn't be around to see McCoy mature anywhere. A director was brought onto the board. There was the distinct impression through the press that. He was not an advocate of Alan Durban. So the breeze changed direction in the summer of 83, which ironically was when the team started to look more solid. I think the attendances were unfairly quoted as one of the reasons, uh, but but I think that it was uh, indicative of the, the state of the game generally. Um, reigning late European Cup winners, Aston Villa, Manchester United, their attendances had dipped. And I think when Durban was sacked, the... A figure that was quoted was the the average attendance at Roker Park in the Sunderland promotion season of 79-80 was compared with one the previous season uh, with Alan Durban struggling to keep the team in the top flight. And as Alan Durban quite correctly said, it would be easy to go down and then come back up as pr promoted with, with the big crowds. But he wanted to achieve success the hard way, the right way, in the top flight. Um, but but certainly I, yes I, I yes I agree the, um, the, the there was changes of foot um, almost an in, in inexorable snowball was gathering uh, speed um, as, as the and, and the cup the cup defeat um, against Birmingham City unfortunately um, expedited matters. Mm -hmm. I think as well, um, something, I mean, again, not, not to give away too much of your turn of phrase and your prose in the book, but a lot of the players signed, as we've gone over, the likes of Ali McCoist, a lot of these were dubbed as tomorrow's team. And naturally, the, the title of the book is Give Us Tomorrow Now. The, 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 the underlying issue with Durban to me seems, or seemed to be rather, that the ambition wasn't in line with expectations to a perfect degree. And that's perhaps something that could be relevant today. I mean, with with the case of Jack Ross, with his situation at the club, I mean, I'm not saying that there, there, are, uh, there are an awful lot of overlaps between him and Durban, but one that does stick out quite profoundly to me is that Jack Ross is obviously pushing for promotion. We're third in the league as it stands. There is certainly no guarantee we're going up, but it's certainly plausible. If we were to, say, finish fourth in the league and then we lost in the playoff semi-final, ultimately the season's dubbed as a failure. But is there perhaps an element of us as fans expecting too much too soon, as was the case with Durban? What I'm essentially getting at here, David, is is there a lesson to be learned that if you want success, ultimately you do have to give a man time? Um, yes, certainly. Um, I mean, both one of the similarities, both men uh, stepped into uh, the fervour, the passion of North East football, what I call the white, he the white heat intensity. Yeah. Um, the media attention, um, I mean, I think Jack Ross, from what I see on social media, he, he, I mean, I'll use Nick's expression, he, the, the, the both, both men were under the microscope. Um, and the, the number of press conferences Jack Ross seem, see, appears uh, to an outsider uh, seems to ha ha have to ha be obliged to give. And sometimes as a supporter, you think, what is it? Would his efforts be better directed on other things and being keep sitting in front of the clicking cameras and with their microphones under his nose? Um, now, now, I think that's one of the, the slight differences, that there was the intensity of um, attention, but I don't think uh, Alan Durban had quite the same gaggle of media. Um, I think it's, it's interesting, that whole point about 
scrutiny, if you like. I think um, you, you mentioned Jack Ross and all the press conferences, and I think it's something he he's wanting to address next season especially. I think he wants to try and shorten the time he spends in press conferences. And even just the other week, he put James Fowler up before the Coventry game, as James says he'll never do one again now. But um, the, the, the point is that, you know, I, I think Jack is very aware of that scrutiny and that scrutiny comes part and parcel of managing Sunderland or Newcastle or teams in the North East where everybody's, we mentioned the microscope, everyone's got a microscope on the football club. And it's almost akin to the Spanish and Italian further that every day they want the story from the club. There's mm-hmm. going to be something coming out of the football club. It, it's and that very... is quite a lot for a manager, a new manager coming into into Sunderland to, to, to come to terms with that if they're not from here and don't really know or understand the dynamic of the football club to the to the fans here. Yeah. yeah. Well, I, think, I think sorry David you go. Oh sorry I, I was rather long-windedly getting to the the crux of your question with um <laughs> but, uh, but I think that both men had have a plan. So that to get down to your your final part of your question. Yeah. Um so I I suppose the the, the case the point is do, do the majority of uh, supporters and the um, hierarchy, uh, the upper hierarchy, do they have confidence that Jack Ross's plan will ultimately succeed? Um, but yes, uh, but it, you can't find that out unless the the manager is given is given time. Mm-hmm. Um, at what point you say, well, that's that's enough. That's that's debatable. That's one of those. Uh, uh, questions. Um, yeah, it's a very difficult answer. I suppose the Sunderland board um, in Durban's tenure didn't have a Uruguayan billionaire lurking in the shadows, <laughs> which you know, which could very well be a big contributing factor to whether or not Jack Ross's ambitions are realised. But I suppose ultimately it's just a case of, you know, will the man be afforded time not only by the board but as well by the fans because there is always going to be an expectation there that someone can do a bit more. I mean, even when we had Steve Bruce in 2010, 2011, there was a certain restlessness I felt around the club that we should be pushing for more. We had a we had a, a taste of what it was like to sit in and around, you know, the spots for European qualification. And we had a player like Darren Bent who was netting 24 a season. Do you think there's an element that when you when it's all going right at Sunderland, you know, when, you, as I say, in the case of Alan, with Alan Durbin, it all... It all flowed very well from the get-go. You know, he was he had a relatively stable job at Stoke. There was little reason to suspect why he would leave that for the um, uh, the uh, I think as, as you call it, is it the the, the white hot, something of of the northeast? Well, what, the white heat intensity. Oh yeah, it was the, it was the yeah it was it was the, the the white heat intensity of the northeast. It was it was the hot seat in Sunderland. I mean, we've had you know former players, we've had former staff on from the 80s, 90s, 70s before, and they've said that the northeast when you're going when it's all going well, it's one of the best places to play your football. And it's the exact opposite when it's going badly. It's a very, it's a very mercurial, very volatile area for your football. You know, as, as wonderful as it is, it, I'd imagine the pressure's immense. But obviously, I suppose not to get sort of too sidetracked by my own point there, because I've got the intention span of a gnat at the best of times. But <laughs> essentially, with with Alan Durban and with Jack Ross, is it a case of, you know, that the, the fans need to stay on side and give the person as well as the board the time? To just let the ambition be realised. Obviously, there is a certain point we have to say, okay, that that you're, you're a lot of time has been spent and you've not got where you need to be. But you know, if 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 um, the championship is tomorrow, then do we need it now? You know, essentially is, or is it maybe is it perhaps a case with Jack Ross now that we need to give this man a bit more time to completely overhaul what was a shell of a club? I think it's interesting. Sorry, David, just that, that point you made before about if Sunderland finished fourth and didn't go up. Yeah. Is that the crossroads moment? Is that your sliding doors moment? Because I think Jack Ross will be the first to say, this isn't my team yet. Mm-hmm. I've had, I mean, he's, he's publicly said when he arrived here, he didn't know who was going to walk through the door. And he's looking out the window and watching Jilibodji and Dong walking in and having to deal with that and then having to lose players because of the wage bill. And then he doesn't know whether McGeady's going to be here in January. He doesn't know whether Oviedo is going to be here or Catamol's going to be here. So this mm-hmm. isn't his team. And we haven't seen him build a team as he did at St Mirren. And I think, you know, it's been sort of, uh, it's been spoken about a lot this season. Kenny Jackett's had a couple of years to build Portsmouth. Um, Barnsley's had a squad and a system in place for a couple of years now to to, to build on that. Uh, even Nigel Clough at Burton, you know, they've, they've maybe underachieved this season, but now they're finding that promotion form again. They, these are all managers that have had a, 
have been given time to build a squad. And if you stand back from what Jack Ross has achieved this season in isolation, for a new manager to come in, pick up the pieces that Jack Ross has had to pick up and achieves a fourth place finish in League One on that basis, you'd actually probably say from the outside, that's a good season. Mm -hmm. It's just that the demands here are so much greater because nobody wants to spend a second season in League One. No. I also think it's a bit of a freak season in some ways when you think about Luton Town being top of the league. It's like, well, it's not like Leicester City winning the league, but it's kind of, no one really expected that. In a normal season, normal season, depending on how you want to, Look at it. Look at that. Um, Sunderland probably would be in the top two with Barnsley, and I think Portsmouth will be where they are. I think the top three of the top four, you probably expect them to be where they are. It just happens to be that there's another team there who nobody's expected and have just you know got in the way. Mm-hmm. Well, so. even Charlton. I mean, you've, you've, it is it is an aberration this season in one sense because you know Sunderland's points total this year probably would get them up automatically any other year. Mm-hmm. But like you say, you've got a Portsmouth, a Charlton. A, a Luton who've blown the, the league away mm-hmm. this season, and that, and you've had to deal with that as well. But I think people people won't look at that. I think in isolation, fans will say it's if, if they don't go up, it's a failure, mm-hmm. which I'm, I, which is understandable, bearing in mind perhaps some of the players that have been at Jack Ross's disposal. But I do think you have to take it in the whole and start in the round and start looking at all the underlying problems and all the underlying. Overhaul. I mean, the, the the club was in crisis, wasn't yeah. it? Last. I mean, it was just completely in bits. Mess. It was a basket case, and basket, so to pull that case. out of the ashes and achieve what they've done this season is is, is remarkable. Hey, it'll do for me. Fourth place in fourth place in League One with the aim to go up automatically next season is a bare minimum. Exp- as a bare minimum, that's fine with me. I, I, I'll I will I will given where we've been and given how. Horrifically, things could have gone under the wrong stewardship and the wrong ownership. I'm, I'll take that. But I suppose that perhaps might not be unanimous among the football club. And obviously, football's a game of opinions. You know, it, another Sunderland fan is entitled to say that um, he doesn't think that Jack Ross should be doing anything less than us getting, getting us up. And that's their opinion and or, or her opinion. And it is what it is. But I think Jack Ross has always said everyone's entitled to their opinion is absolutely right. But there are lines you don't step over no I think you know you, you people are entitled to opinion I think if it's if it's backed up with a sensible and sort of well thought out sort of um, a, do you know what I'm saying yeah there's, there's constructive criticism rather than obviously just then there's slander yeah, yeah. There, there, there is, there's a line but I suppose the roundabout point I'm getting to I'll throw it back to you David is that are there parallels there with fan expectations between Durban and Ross um, I think what's excited or generated the, a lot of the most interest among supporters over the decades is transfer news yeah and so uh, when Jack Ross does have a team that you, you're going to describe as his team with his personnel in then it would be easier to judge but he needs so he definitely needs the time to, to reach that stage um and and the the feeling of often among supporters well in, in Durban's era was that the team's not playing oh the team's struggling so what, a new signing w- will transform everything. And Alan Durban, he didn't have the money, realistic money, when he was interested in John Walk for £400,000. He's trying to offer £100,000 plus, are you interested in any of our players? And it was, it was unrealistic. Um, so it, I think when, um, if, if, and again, so if Jack Ross is funded... Um, which presumably he, he he will be, and he mm, has the, the, the question mark. Uh, the <laughs> yeah. So so that that's that's one that's one huge difference between Alan Durban's reign. Um, so th- to some extent, um, the manager is is judged on the, the success or failure of his of his transfer acquisitions. But then, any reasonable person should also take into account what funds has he been supplied with, mm-hmm. which wasn't. Um, which Alan Durban uh, wasn't given the benefit of. Really. I agree completely. I suppose one final question for you, David, is I think obviously, you know, like I'm, 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 I'm very happy to be giving a platform for your book, but I think as well, when, I, when, when we do like to speak about books, I like to think about perhaps if we are going to maybe say like recommend this to the listeners today, what I mean, I, I was thinking when I was when I because I, I've been, you know, I'm, I would say about a quarter of the way through, maybe a little bit further than that in, into your book, and 
I like look. I like to draw comparisons between other books if I was to recommend it to somebody else. Now, probably my favourite sporting novel on football. Um, again, it's a lot more of a sensationalised biography. You know, like a lot of it draws on sort of like maniacal monologues. But it's um, it's the Damned United by David Priest. You know, the um, the, the 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 man versus society story of Brian Clough in the sort of the morally sort of corrupt world of of um, uh, of Don Reavy telling the place to chuck the medals away, and obviously. You know, the the this it, the story itself differs uh, greatly from from Alan Alan Durbin's time at Sunderland, but again, there there again is the theme of a manager comes in and they they don't meet what's needed of them. They 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 don't match what is what is asked of them from the board and from the fans. And it, ultimately, it's a man coming into a foreign environment where they're you know they're up against a different animal. You know, far out of the comfort zone, and it's it's sort of a very different thing. I don't know what you think. But would would you see um, "Give Us Tomorrow Now" being something you could recommend for fans of the Damned United, to any extent, or are there any other books that perhaps you would say? Yes, to some extent, because um, the Damned United is is focusing on the um, mid well seventy four ish period um, specifically, um, and anybody over a certain age, I would say. Uh, certainly over 40, uh, uh, possibly over 45 uh, for, the, for the Sunderland, for the Give Us Tomorrow Now book, I think they, they would lap up the, the names, the references, hopefully the analytical detail as well um, uh, that's contained within the book. But I mean, the, um, and, and the Damned United with figures like uh, Brian Clough and then all the figures at uh, uh, Leeds United and Derby County and I mean it's obviously been televised now a lot of people will be more familiar with them from the TV, TV adaptation mm. um, there's a lot of familiar names there um, and it's it's I, I do bracket the late 70s I, I mean I do specialise particularly in the anything from about um, se- the mid 70s through to the late 80s and I, and I think it would Appeal to people of above, of above a certain age generally. However, the, I'm not discounting younger people because when I was young, I did like to read about Sunderland in the 1930s and even earlier. Um, oh, I love it, mate. Yeah. I, I, I love sort of like sort of like like, like sort of like the, the. I mean, obviously, again, the, the damn Dyke is, is to an extent sensationalised. You know, you've got a lot. Of, I mean, like I think every other chapter is in italics and it goes back to Brancloff's time at like. You know, at, at Hartlepool, Derby, etc., and then obviously you've got his like sort of almost, almost say, like maniacal monologues of his of his you know like handful of days at Leeds. But it, it's it what, what I like about both books, yours and David Priest's, is that obviously it offers them, uh, you know, with with an articulate prose, it offers like a very good history lesson on football in that era. You know, a, a lot of it's sort of like you know. And, and and again, it, it, there's a lot of like what you can see in today's football, perhaps from lessons that aren't learned back then, which which you know, which I, I pray to God isn't the case with Alan Durbin and Jack Ross. But you know, the, the the fact is there that there are people who've called for Jack Ross's head, and I think perhaps there is a lesson to be learned from 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 the Dur- from the Durbin saga to yeah, to an extent. I, I mean, if there if there was a just just for one example of a book, I would could, could compare it with um, that, that I've read um, in the, within the past year. Um, there is a slight parallel. There was a book that was uh, produced and uh, published on Ron Saunders, the Aston Villa manager, at his reign at Aston Villa. So for somebody like me who was fanatically interested in football in the, in the late 70s, early 80s, and bear in mind that squads were talking about, I think Aston Villa won the squad with 15 or 16 players. Um, all the names are familiar. I do not necessarily have to be a supporter of Aston Villa to pick up the Ron Saunders book, The Odd, which is I'll give it a name, check the odd, the odd man out. Yeah. Um, I don't have to be an Aston Villa supporter to read that and thoroughly enjoy it because all the players that have been mentioned um, from all of the from nearly every other team, the managers, the players, they're familiar to me. They're almost like household names. It's interesting because we had a, got, we were in a conversation in the office the other day about just that thing, about them, especially the 1970s and 80s. I'm referring back to the 1980s Liverpool team. And, and some people in my generation, we probably, I mean, not we weren't Liverpool fans, but we probably could all pretty much name the Liverpool team of the late 70s and 80s because they were so dominant. 
they were they were the team of the moment and they were winning the European Cups and they were winning the the championship and the same thing about you know Aston Villa at the time I mean there's a there's a generational thing when you go to Villa Park now and see the names up around the stadium of the team that won the European Cup yeah. they were all household names and they, and they were all small squads of players made up of the even when you were mentioning earlier Frank Worthington Frank Worthington when I was growing up was a real superstar he was the you know he he was the sort of uh, Raheem Sterling of his day I mean he was the sort of and so the, I mean it is a generational thing but I think there is a, there's a lot of cachet in it yeah yeah um, that's speaking of um, teams I was going to ask you um David obviously Sonnen did get to a cup final in 85 and uh, Mill Cup and I was going to ask about if you can remember the lineup in that game um, yeah, uh, Chris Turner, Barry it's, Venison was the captain. Yes. Um, was Pickering wearing number three shirt that that day? Yes. We had um, centre halves, uh, David Corner. Well, David Corner, obviously. Yeah. And you can't you can't you can't forget <laughs> the other one. And, and, yeah. and, and, and obviously, and Gordon Chisholm was un, 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 unlucky when his uh, this shot he actually deflected past Turner from from him. Um, Ian Wallace, David Hodgson. Um, oh, Cl- Clive Walker obviously missed the penalty. Uh, Howard Gale was substitute. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, who, who am I missing? The number seven? And, uh, no, you're missing the number. Oh, this one particularly it's close to me. Oh, Gar- <laughs> Gary, Gary Bennett. Yes. <laughs> uh, I think you got two more after that. So it's number seven and number ten. Uh, Peter Daniel in the team. Yes. So I'm, I'm, I'm waiting. I'm, I'm, I need the number ten now, don't yeah. I? Oh. Oh yeah, I I I do know this, but uh, I'm, I'm, I feel like I'm, I'm, I'm not going to waste air time, valuable air time. <laughs> when, uh, somebody of my years, it'll, it'll come to me in, in twenty minutes. First name is Steve. Oh, Steve Burry. There you go. Yes, there you go. <laughs> There's the whole team. There we go. Jobs are good. Yep. Oh, fantastic stuff. So, so I suppose, yeah. Um, I think we should be all good to wrap that up there. So thank you very much, David, for taking the time out of your day to come into the studio and tell us all about your book and everything that goes with it and its relevancies today. It's, it's been a fantastic discourse. Thank you very much. Thank you for inviting me. Yeah, yeah, thank you. And thank you very much to Nick. Always a pleasure to have yes, you in. Thank you. So I know yeah. I'm going to watch the Damn United again now. Isn't it? Oh, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I've still actually not seen that, you know. Have you not uh, seen it? No, I've only read it. Yeah, I've not seen it. It is good. Yeah. I watched yeah. it on the day before I went to Wembley. That was the first time I've seen it. It was great. I loved it. Great. Uh, fantastic. Yeah. I actually watched the proper interview, like the, the original interview. Oh, it's with... so oh, good, that. Yeah, yeah. Love yeah. that, mate. It's just like, you, I, you'd never get that today. Mm. The, the, the closest we had today was when Julian Les got called out, like Chris Sutton, for um, uh, saying that, or calling out someone for saying that, like, Leicester weren't bigger than Celtic or something. I don't know who it was, I forget now, but that's the closest you get now to a, to a Cluffy Reavy sort of like verbal spa live on mm-hmm. <laughs> live on um, uh, British television. But thank you as well, Johnny. Obviously, yes. you know, it's always good to have you here. Always making sure that the sound's good. Yeah, so um, last little whip round question to leave off. Give me your score predictions and scores for Peterborough. We'll start with Johnny. Oh, Quick as you can. Uh, two 0 Sunland. Scorers. Who's going to score? Charlie and Max Power. Charlie and go. Max Power. Nick. Yeah. Uh, I think they're going to win two one, and I think it'll be Morgan and Wyke again. Wyke. Do you want to hazard a guess, David? Uh, one one. One one. One of our midfielders will score. Fair enough. Okay. Good stuff. <laughs> I'm going to go with a. I'm going to feel like it's going to be a 2-1. I feel like it's going to be a, a closer game. I feel like they'll have a bit more about them than Doncaster will. But our goal scorers are going to be Charlie White and Will Grigg. Simple as. White early on in the game. Grigg coming on as a sub. Jobs okay. are good. Brilliant. Yeah. So I think we'll leave that there. Thank you very much for listening to the first and last episode of the Oz Turk Overview. Hopefully it doesn't play an absolute clanger next game. So I can use that joke again. Thank you very much and good night. Some exchange betting companies run short-lived promotions, like months-long offers of low commission. At BetDAG, we wanted to change the way we did things, so we set our commission at 2% permanently. That's 2% on football, horse racing, golf, almost any sport. 2%. That's just one way that BetDAG is changing for the better. For the better, like you. BetDAG, the 2% commission exchange. Over 18s only, please gamble responsibly.